Observe closely. Ever watch James Bond gracefully navigate a room? Mr. Bond. James Bond. Sherlock Holmes effortlessly deduce social nuances? The name's Sherlock Holmes and the address is 221B Baker Street. In a world where such cinematic moments hint at the power of refined manners, did you know that mastering this art can open doors to 70% of career opportunities? So gents, let's start with basics. Introduction. Rule number one, you need to take the initiative and oftentimes introduce yourself. You can't wait for other people to introduce you. And even though that is proper etiquette in many situations, most people do not know this. So they'll be in a group and this person does not know this person and they don't make the introduction. When you recognize that or you are that person that doesn't know somebody, you need to take the initiative, take the bull by the horns and introduce yourself. Rule number two, be genuinely curious about the people you're meeting. I can't stress this enough. Most people, let's be honest, they don't even want to be there. They're talking with people that they're not even paying attention to. They're droning out. And that's why they don't remember anything, why they actually don't ask good questions. If you are genuinely curious about this person, even if it's from the simple perspective of, I am a human being, they are a human being, I would love to simply learn more about their story. You would be amazed at the way that you can connect with someone when you actually are interested in what they have to say. And rule number three, assume that everyone likes you. You know how we mess things up? We get into our own heads and we're thinking, oh, this person isn't going to like me. This person, I've heard about them. They've got a reputation. No, assume that everyone likes you and treat them like that. Treat them like a friend because people are going to mirror your behavior. All of a sudden, they're going to feel that a nice positive vibe. And yes, the vibe is real and you can put it out. Okay, so we've laid out the ground rules. Now let's talk about the next three steps. First up, you're going to grab their attention. We do that by saying hello, by saying howdy, whatever it is that you say to grab their attention, do it. Then next up, my name is. Again, you take the bull by the horns, you take the initiative, you introduce yourself, and then the third part is the physical contact. You're going to shake their hand. You're going to perhaps, maybe culturally, you don't touch them, but maybe you're going to bow. Whatever it is in your culture, you go ahead and you take that next step. Now you know how to introduce yourself. Now let's talk about eye contact. Tip number one, know where you stand. You want to get feedback from somebody that you trust, maybe work with a coach, but you want to know, are you making too much eye contact or are you making not enough? If you're not making enough eye contact, you will come off as weak. Someone that's a pushover, someone that people don't take seriously. If you make too much eye contact, all of a sudden you come off as being overly aggressive. Tip number two, know how long to maintain eye contact. On average, you're looking for about three seconds. So when you're looking and talking with someone, be thinking one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, and then you can safely look away for a second, maybe nod your head like you're listening, but about three seconds is perfect. Now, this next tip is about you having impact when you're speaking to a group of people. You want to look people in the eye so that they remember what you say. This is based on a 2006 study out of the University of Sterling. What they found is that if you go around and you're making eye contact, when you're talking to people about something that's important that you want them to remember, by making that eye contact, they're much more likely to remember the words coming out of your mouth. Now, this next tip is a bit of an interrogation secret. It comes out of Tufts University. And what they discovered is that when you give people long eye contact, we're talking five, eight, 10 seconds and they know they're being looked at, they are more likely to be truthful when they're speaking to you. So you want to get the truth out of somebody, just keep looking at them and boom, that truth is going to come out. Now, this next tip is all about being remembered. It comes out of Rutgers University and what they found is when you're making eye contact with someone and you want to be remembered, I think this works well with men and women, is basically as you're turning your head, continue to make eye contact for as long as you can. And I think women are really good with this, but guys, this has been shown clearly to make you more memorable. Now, this next tip is almost more of a warning, and that is to be careful of people in authority, you giving them too much eye contact. Maybe your boss, you're talking with them, you're listening to them, you're wanting to show you're attentive. Make sure that you're not overdoing it with that eye contact. Now let's talk about when to make eye contact. It's important you make the eye contact at the very beginning of the conversation. You want to make it early on and then you can start to look over somewhere else to break it up. The next tip, be fair with the distribution of your eye contact. It's difficult at times, especially when someone's talking and you're wanting to give them most of your attention. And when you're talking to a big crowd, again, scan the room. Don't get focused in on one particular area. Make sure that you give the people on the edges some eye contact and you look over this way as well. 
Now, this next tip is for you travelers out there. And when you go to a new country, understand that it's not just about the culture change, but there also may be a different dominant religion. And definitely the eye contact rules could be very different from your home country. Now, as a foreigner, oftentimes we get somewhat of a free pass, but it is something you can still offend people. You can make people uncomfortable. You can make people upset. And you're going to be way ahead of most people if you understand these basic rules. So, do your homework and show up prepared. So now let's talk about the eye contact rules between men and women. And the first rule here is that just because she's looking at you does not mean she's interested. You need to look at the environment. Are you at work? It could be she's looking at you because she simply wants to engage and ask you a question and you happen to be running that department. Now, if you are in an environment, like you're at a wedding, you don't know who this woman is and she's checking you out. It's a very different situation. So you got to pay attention to the environment. So what are the eye contact indicators that the woman is interested in you? First up, look for the fact that she's making eye contact. Women oftentimes are going to try to initiate eye contact with somebody they like multiple times before the guy picks up on it and catches and looks their way. Then when you make eye contact, she's going to maintain it for about two to three seconds and then look away. And this could happen multiple times. The third thing you're looking for is a smile or some indicator that she's happy to have made the eye contact. At this point, guys, it's up to you. Walk across and introduce yourself. Jens, if you want to step up your style efficiently and effectively, look for a proven path. A curriculum that saves you from confusion, from bad information, from crappy teachers. You want to make sure that you're not just learning facts, but you actually are being shown concepts. Lessons that give you foundations, they give you the fundamentals to be able to dress sharp in any situation. It's also great if you can surround yourself with like-minded men, because how many times have you tried to learn something and there are other people that don't want to be there, they're distracting you, or worse, they're tempting you to go do something else. Which is why, gents, I wanted to show you this, my new free group for you that not only has instruction, but an amazing community that is distraction free. It's got a great app. And did I say it's free guys? I developed this for you. Finally, I found a platform that makes this so simple, so easy and so effective for you to be able to step up your style. Seriously, gents, I've got courses in this community that I used to sell you can get for free. I've set up prizes. I've gamified it. Guys, I'm going to link to it down in the description. Or if you just want to go over to the URL, it's at school.com slash RMRS. This group is free, although you do have to answer three questions. These I don't ask for your email address. I simply want to make sure that we keep spammers out of the group. It's a high quality group. It's an amazing community that I am proud to give to you guys. Now, the next tip I want to stress is just because a woman doesn't make eye contact with you does not mean that she doesn't like you. It could be someone that she is used to actually when she does make eye contact, men are overly aggressive. So, you find that oftentimes women are going to be more shy when it comes to eye contact, especially with someone they don't know very well. So, what to do when you make eye contact? contact with a woman, smile. Simply show that, hey, you're a nice person. That's all you're looking to do. And this is something I think more men could do because I know I still fall into the trap of kind of looking away. It's just something I feel awkward. But guys, practice looking at people and smiling. And yes, you could smile at other men too. Now, this next tip, it needs to be said, but guys, when you're speaking to a woman, look her in the eyes. Don't stare down at her chest. There are ways that you can condition yourself. You can train yourself not to stare. So, the first thing I recommend is actually looking at a woman in the eyes and trying to figure out what color eye color she has. This is a great thing to know. When you can actually remember somebody's eyes, you're ahead of most guys. Next up, let's talk about sticky eyes. And this is when you're talking with someone and you let your eyes linger just a bit longer. That shows you're very much interested in them that you're very attracted to them. And this is a great technique to use when you're talking to a woman and you're having to go away, but you keep maintaining that eye contact and you give them a smile. That right there, it's very attractive to women. So, we talked about where not to look when you're making eye contact, but where should you look? The obvious answer is the eyes. What you're looking to do is the oval between both eyes. So, you can go a little bit up on the forehead. You can go maybe on the bridge of the nose, but that oval is going to be the area that you want to maintain eye contact with. And yes, you can go from eye to eye if that's easier for you. Next up, let's talk about blinking. So, I've had it said to me that I don't blink enough, but understand that you can blink too much. You notice I'm blinking a lot there. So, if you're blinking more than 30 times in a minute, 
that's too much. What you're going for is about 15 to 10 blinks per minute. Now, if you're only blinking about five times per minute, that or less, that it actually comes off. It's just kind of weird. People pick up on it and uh, yeah, something. some people think you're a robot. I've had that said of me. Other times, if you're blinking too much, it can come off as something's wrong. Even if your eye contact is great, but your posture and walk can define a lot about you and most of the men get this one wrong. The first mistake that men make when they're out walking is they look down. And when you look down, you look weak. You want to look at least straight forward and possibly even look a little bit high, a little bit up. Raise up that chin. It's going to make you look more confident. Do not look down. This just makes you look bad. It makes you look weak. The next mistake that men make when it comes to walking, they actually walk with their feet too close together or with their toes pointed out. And this can actually point towards a deeper problem, maybe with your posture, maybe with the structure, maybe you've got a weight issue and you waddle when you walk. Now, I know that this is difficult, but again, practice makes permanent. You want to actually be paying attention and try to actually maybe spread those heels out just a bit. Why? Because you're a man. Actually spread it out a bit and give a nice walk. And again, I'm not talking about extremes, but I am talking about finding what works for you and looking when something's a bit off. I highly recommend you videotape yourself, look at the way you walk normally, and then look to make some corrections. Next up, don't hunch your shoulders. You don't want your shoulders going over right here. This just looks, again, it makes you look weak, like you're trying to minimize the amount of space that you're taking up. Point being, guys, get those shoulders back, put that chest out, walk with confidence. Now, this next point is tied to the shoulders as well, and that is pay attention to your shoulders and don't be afraid when you're walking to sway. Now, there's this interesting study I remember. Whenever men knew they were being watched by women, they were more likely to sway their shoulders. Why do you do this? Because it signals confidence that you are built up. And yeah, not some, not all of us are built as large as I am. So in that case, you want to wear possibly a sports jacket, wear a leather jacket, build up some padding on that shoulders. It's actually going to exaggerate and it's going to, whenever you're walking, you're going to look stronger. You're going to look more confident. Next up, don't put your hands in your pocket. Again, it's going to hunch the shoulders over, but basically by you putting your hands in your pocket, you come off as a bit more submissive, but by having your hands visible, there's a number of things right here. Other people are going to be less suspicious because they can see your hands and from a, you know, fight or flight, you actually can quickly raise them to defend yourself. Next up, don't be so tense. So a lot of you guys, you get nervous and you tighten up your hands into a fist and you barely move your arms as you're walking around. In fact, I mean, you're so nervous when you're out there walking, you know people are looking at you, maybe you're walking out on stage, that you literally do not move your arms. It makes you look anxious. It makes you look worried. Now, you're going to have to think through this. This is something not a lot of people notice, but if you're doing it, guys, make sure to correct the problem. The next mistake, you walk way too slow. Now, this is based off a 1995 study out of the Journal of Ethology and Sociobiology. But what they found is that on average, if a man walked a bit quicker, he walked faster. He was perceived as higher status. The next walking mistake that men make that makes them look weak is that they walk behind people. And I understand there are certain protocols. If you're hanging out with the queen, then in that case, yes, you're going to walk behind her over to the side to defer respect and power. But most of us aren't out walking with the queen. So in that case, hey, what you want to do is make sure that you're walking with someone. And if you're expected to lead a group, then you walk out in front. When you walk behind, you are deferring power. You are showing that they are ahead of you. The next mistake that men make that makes them look weak when they're out walking is they take too small of steps. And you've heard the saying, practice makes perfect. Pra it's not true. Practice makes permanent. And a lot of people, they have just gotten used to taking smaller steps. And despite having longer legs or even shorter legs, doesn't matter if I'm not talking about short guys having to take as long of steps as big guys, but I am talking about proportionally good size steps for your body build. This may not matter most times, unless maybe you're going to go up in front of a group. You're going to want to stride out there. You want to show them, hey, I've got these long steps. I know where I'm going. I'm walking with confidence. How do you place your legs when you take a seat? Never thought about it? Most people don't. And that can be an issue because the way you place your legs, the way you position them can have an effect on how people perceive you, how you actually think, 
And if you're not controlling the message in a negotiation, in a big meeting, in an interview, that can be an issue. I'm going to talk about the five most common seated leg positions, the message they send and how you can control that message. The first seated leg position I want to talk about is the knees together position. This is where your legs are out straight in front of you. Your knees are about two to 10 inches apart. Now, what's interesting about this one is for most men, this is a learned seating position, not a natural one. Because as men, we've got something between our legs. We are built in a way that this is not natural. We need a bit more room. But let's say you grow up in a city, you travel a lot on an airplane, you don't like to touch people. You are constantly trying to minimize your space. When you do that, you build up a habit of sitting in this position. Now, what does this signal to other people? When you try to minimize your space, you come off as weaker. Also, it can make you look more closed and it does for some people have that effect of just simply closing them off. I find for most men, this is not a good seated position. Simply, it's uncomfortable. It doesn't feel great. I feel like I'm crushing myself. So, I know I try to avoid this. Now, the next seated leg position I'm going to talk about is the spread knee position. And this is where your legs, again, are in front of you. Your knees are apart by 10 to 24 inches this time. Now, this is a natural sitting position for most men. And I love this seating position because I think it's right for most men in most situations. Why? Because of the message that you send to others and that you send and you reinforce with yourself, which is one of strength, power, dominance, and status. In addition, the message you're sending yourself is, I am relaxed. I am open to the conversation with others. Now, don't take this to an extreme. Don't take up three seats on a subway whenever there's a pregnant woman and an older guy over here who need a seat. Simply look around, show other people respect. But I do think in general that men should not be forced to close in on themselves because it also closes up their mind. But when you can sit in a position that you're comfortable and you take up your natural amount of space, that's, I think, the optimum seating position for most men. All right, so we're through with keeping your legs straight. Now, let's talk about crossing your legs. In general, guys, the one thing I want you to remember when you cross your legs is that you do send the signal of closing yourself off. So, the third leg position I'm going to be talking about in the first cross leg position is the leg over leg position. Some people call this the European leg over leg position. Supposedly, it is more common over in Europe. It is, again, a learned behavior. One of the issues with the leg over leg, me personally, I think it's incredibly uncomfortable. Another issue with this is the message it sends. This shows basically that you are protecting yourself, that you are going to, and it forces you also to usually put yourself back like this. It shows that you're listening, but you are, you're making a judgment. You are, to, you're a back. You are removed from the situation. Understand of all the like positions, this one right here shows that you're the most closed off. The fourth seated leg position I want to talk about is the figure four leg lock position. Yes, I know that sounds like a cool wrestling move. Very common in North America. So, it also is called the American leg lock position. And there are two variations. There's the variation when you just have the ankle up on your knee and also the clasp variation. Whenever you reach up and you've got your hands up on your ankle in front of you as well. And it shows basically for many people, this is going to be the most open of all of the cross leg positions. Basically, because you're showing and you're exposing yourself saying, hey, I'm open, I'm here, very relaxed. This one also sends a strong signal of status, of dominance, of power. The issue I have with this cross-like position is some people view it as basically you are aloof, that you're listening just because you have to be there. Also, in some cultures, showing the bottom of your foot is a no-no, so be aware of that as well. The fifth seated leg position I'm going to talk about today is the ankle lock position. And this is basically where one of your ankles is over the other. For some people, this is very comfortable. For most people, this is unconscious that they get into this position. So, the interesting thing about the ankle lock position is it unconsciously reveals sometimes what a person is thinking. Now, you need to know what that person's baseline body language and behavior is, but for many people, it can be a sign of nervousness, something that they're scared, that they're closed off for some reason. You can be talking with somebody and you can pick up that, okay, they're bouncing their foot, they've got their ankles crossed. Maybe they're, in a sense, protecting themselves or they're thinking about something, but their mind isn't there. Manners maketh the man. Do you know what that means? No? Well, let me give you a lesson. 
So, the first set of manners I'm going to talk about are general respect manners. This is you being mindful of other human beings. Starting this off, the word please. You can use this in any request, sometimes in a question. The word please just simply acknowledges that you're asking another human being who is your equal to do something. Now, can you overuse it? Perhaps, but I find in today's society that is rare. Next up, we've got the word thank you. This is a common expression of gratitude. Anytime somebody does something for you, you want to thank them with a verbal thank you or in some cases, send a note. Next up, let's talk about interrupting others. This is when others are speaking, when they're doing something and you are going to step in. In general, you don't want to do this, but if you need to, make sure to use the word excuse me. Now, using the word excuse me is also a polite way to grab somebody's attention or to ask them to repeat themselves. The next set of respect manners I'm going to steal from the book, The Four Agreements. And if you've read this great book, you know the first agreement is be impeccable with your word. What this means is that your words are very powerful. Only say what you mean and mean everything that you say. Gossip, talking about people behind their backs. We're all guilty of it. I am guilty of it. And why do we do it? I don't know. Maybe it feels good. It's something we don't have the courage to say to that person's face. Point being is think about what you're saying and be impeccable with your word. Right with that, let's talk about criticism. Criticism in public, shaming somebody in front of other people. I view this as bad manners. I think there's better ways to approach this for me if I'm going to criticize. And I do think it's necessary sometimes to be truthful with people. Do this in private. Publicly, I think that you should compliment and build up. Next up, we've got meal manners. And the first thing I will say here is observe the customs of others whether it be your neighbor and you're over for a meal with them, whether you're out in another country with a group of friends, observe what is going on and follow. Case in point, my neighbors are very religious people. Whenever we break bread with them, whether it be at their home or our home, we know what they observe. We know what matters to them. So, we always let them lead in a prayer. We don't necessarily do that at my home, but it is something that I understand it's important to them. So, we have good manners and we acknowledge, we observe their belief. And let's talk about when to eat. A lot of people, they sit down, they're used to eating by themselves. And so, they're served, they start eating. But if you're in a group of people, if you're eating with a family, is everyone served? Usually, you wait till everyone is served. If it's a small party, we're talking five to six people. If it's a larger party, more than eight people. In that case, if 75%, 50% of the people have been served on really large ones, you can begin eating. You can also ask permission. Hey, is it okay if I start to eat? Again, they may be waiting to say a prayer. It may be something that they want to make sure everyone is seated. They're going to do a toast. I know in my family, we like to do toasts. So, things like this are important to observe and to understand. Other basic rules, whenever you're seated, put your napkin on your lap no elbows on the table. And whenever you're chewing your food, chew with your mouth closed. Don't talk with your mouth full. If you need to burp, try to do it silently. If you need to get up to use the bathroom or other people are still seated, you will simply say, excuse me, get up and make sure to push your chair back in. Gents, now you know the essential manners for being a gentleman, but without a good mindset, all that would not even matter. First up, gentlemen, we've got honor. Now, I'm going to equate honor with integrity. To me, these go right together. And when I think of honor, when I think of integrity, I think of having a standard that you live to. You do what you say you're going to do. And the way to imagine this is the opposite. The opposite of having honor, of having integrity is to be a hypocrite. A hypocrite says one thing and does another because it's easy, because it's convenient. They bend their morals. If you have integrity, if you have honor, you know what you stand for and you stand for it. The next characteristic of the modern gentleman is courage. And this one's misunderstood because most people don't know how to actually be courageous. It's something, well, I'm not on a battlefield. How can I stand up and be courageous and lead troops in the combat? That is a type of courage, but that's very rare. For the vast majority of people, it's living day to day and it's seeing something that's wrong and actually having the conviction, the commitment, the courage to stand up and right that wrong. You know, your boss, maybe he's yelling at everyone on the team. He has no leadership skills and he's hurting this company. Maybe you need to go speak to his boss. Maybe you need to speak to him directly. Yes, you could lose your job, but you know what? You know that what he's doing is wrong. It's hurting the company. You've got to have the courage, the commitment to stand up to the right people. 
The next characteristic of a modern gentleman is to be mindful. That means you're going through life and you're actually aware of what's going on, not only with yourself, but with others. You're paying attention to the way people are, to the way, oh, this person is having an off day. I can tell because of the way that she's acting. Or you're paying attention to your own body. Why am I so stressed out? Maybe I need to get more sleep. I need to eat better. I need to take better care of my own body. The next mark of a modern gentleman is respect, both given and received. So let's talk about giving respect. Who do you give it to? You give it to everybody because they're all human beings. When you understand that, all of a sudden you realize when you give that respect, a lot of times you're going to receive it back. But what happens when you don't receive the respect back? Well, you move on and you realize this is not someone I want to engage with. Have your own self-respect that you just expect a certain level from people that you engage with. The next characteristic of a modern gentleman is chivalry. Some people say chivalry is dead. That's a bunch of BS. And let me be clear, chivalry is not just doing things for women, like opening doors. It's more than that. It's serving your fellow human being, whether they be a child, an older man, or even an able-bodied man. Anytime you can serve another person, that is chivalry. The next mark of a modern gentleman is commitment. When you say you're going to do something, you need to do it. Your word is your bond. People learn to depend on you. And that's a big deal because there are so many people out there that you can't depend on to show up, to be there when you need them. You want to be that rock. You want to be that foundation that people can depend on. Next up, a gentleman is confident, not arrogant and not overconfident. So if you're confident, you know what your abilities are and you know the limitations of those strengths. You know your weaknesses. You build up confidence over time. It's something that comes with your ability. It's something that comes as you develop an expertise. But arrogance is actually where you take, okay, I'm really good at this. And all of a sudden you let it blind you and take you down a path where you're actually insulting and hurting others. Overconfidence is where you actually do not know your limitations and you go off and you try to do things that you haven't tested. Maybe you think you can do, but you're not truly able to do. The next characteristic of a modern gentleman, he's got impeccable manners and he understands etiquette. Now, the difference between etiquette and manners, what is it? Manners, it's how you make people feel. Etiquette, those are the rules in society and manners always trump etiquette. So, give you an example, you're at a dinner party and all of a sudden, someone's breaking a rule of etiquette. They were eating before everyone has been served, before prayer has been said. So, do you go point this out to them? Do you make them feel like a fool? Probably not, especially if you're the host. You realize this person just simply has different customs. They have broken a rule of etiquette, but you're not going to break manners and you're going to simply treat them the way you would like to be treated. So, the next mark of a modern gentleman is that he seeks fulfillment not necessarily happiness. Now, there's a big difference here. Happiness is something we feel whenever maybe you accomplish a goal. You do something and you feel good about it and that's great. Happiness is a good thing, but it's something that goes up and down and it doesn't last. Fulfillment is something that you work for and you feel deep down inside you. So, if you can imagine happiness is liking something, fulfillment is loving something. So, whether this applies to your job, whether this applies to your personal relationships, make sure you seek fulfillment, not always happiness. So, what video to watch next? How about this one? Outdated manners and etiquette. Should you be following these? Guys, in this video, I break it out. So, some of these and the manners I covered in today's video, I think every man should follow. But what about some of these old school ones? What about these ones that people consider outdated? Find out what I think in this video right here.